Sonia Gray. Hey, hey. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Thank you for having me. Very excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden Studio. You've spent a bit of time in here over the last, what, year or so? Yeah, a couple of years probably. Um, God, fond memories in this place. This year, actually, two of the greatest test victories I witnessed. Commentated. Well, can I say commentated? Uh, you tell us. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, officially commentating for the ACC, but I love cricket. Um, and I kind of lose my professionalism sometimes when things are tight. And so sometimes I just can't speak, which is not great when you're actually <laughs> meant to be a commentator. Yeah. Um, or I get very, very vocal and very emotional and disappear under the desk and all sorts of things go on. Go to the beer fridge, it's a common one, yeah. in the middle of the over. Um, but yeah, we had some extraordinary wins and just I just felt so proud of our side. I just, yeah. Were you a fan of the ACC before you joined as a commentator? I was more your traditional commentary, I'll be honest with you. Um, but as far as working, it's so great to be, because I'm not, I, I've never played cricket. Well, I, I played one game at high school, um, but I, I don't really understand why anyone would play it, which is why I love it, because there is so much failure in cricket. You're failing 95% of the time, so... To me, witnessing the courage that those guys and girls have is, you know, courage is so inspirational and just there's so much to learn about the game. So so the traditional, working for the ACC, I can just say whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I, I must admit that um, this year in our uh, win against the English side, I got quite emotional. Michael Bracewell ran himself out in a really, really stupid way and I lost all perspective and dropped the F-bomb twice. Uh, you can, can I say what yeah, I said? Yeah, okay. Nice. Well, I can't really remember. It was, oh God, it was terrible. But um, I said something along the lines of, um, what the fuck just happened? I can't fucking believe it. <laughs> what, you know, with emotion. Yeah. And then I, I just, there was silence and I saw the other two looking at me and I was like, Oh my God, I just did that out loud. <laughs> and I think, you know, this is a funny thing. As a broadcaster, you guys would know too, there's a line, this imaginary line, and you know it, and you know that you do not cross that. And, and I've been doing this for a long time, and I just know where the line is, and I lost it. I just, <laughs> and then that fear that maybe I'd be on lotto, and I'd just be like, <laughs> and there's your fucking number nine. <laughs> Fuck, fucking, I hope that's, you know, buddy. I, I really was, I just, and I went out to the, let's call it a green room. Um, not really a green room, but, you know, a, let's call it a green room. And uh, Mike Lane, the CEO of uh, <laughs> ACC, I said, Mike, Mike, I'm, I'm so sorry. And he, w he was silent and he said, and he said uh, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the BSA, the complaints. I don't know, I'm just sort of thinking what I'm going to say. And I thought, I have totally screwed up. Not forgetting all the terrible things uh, that are said on the ACC. <laughs> yeah. But I was just like, you know, maybe I'm not allowed to do it. I'm meant to be the good one. Uh, amazing. He was kidding. He yeah, was kidding. very much so. Yeah. Very yeah, much but so. I, I really believed like him. Yeah. 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 Yes, the commentator's perineum. Like, if that's... That's a that's a line. Like that's quite a far line. I feel like saying fuck. Yeah, but I think this one was It's on Sky on Spark, yeah. right? Like the, the oh, yeah. Spark. It's like we're, we're the old school that was just yeah, on Lightheart true, Radio. True, so true. A, the bar you talk about was a bit yeah. lower then. The milk of the Jap side definitely wouldn't fly <laughs> on Spark <laughs> Spark Sport R I P. Yeah. That the cricket I, I want to stick with cricket for a bit because you mentioned you played one game in high school. Yeah. And Shay has put in my notes that in that game you either scored fifty or seventy runs. Sixty four, I said. Oh, oh. yes. Sixty four not out. Sorry. I said that. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't listening. I wish you'd read the notes. <laughs> but hang on, how does that work? You put one game of cricket and you score yeah, sixty four yeah. and you don't play again. Yeah. Well I you know, I was thinking about my average and you know, <laughs> wanted to keep it high. Um yeah, sixty four not out, all scored in boundaries. <laughs> Well, no. After really? that innings, yes. After that innings, I was like, <laughs> "Found my new sport." Hello, hello. We went out to field, and that was a different story. Mm. Uh, you know that high ball yeah. coming, and you're like, "Oh, now we'll do a forward, back, forward, back." Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not a fielder, and you have to do both, apparently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you T can't. twenty would have been your game by the sound stand of it. In the slip. Oh, I just well, I was a sprinter actually in high school, sprinter and long jumper. Yeah. Um, so that takes up a lot of time. So there wasn't really, you know, space to, for another sport to drop in there. 
But yeah, I, I have a healthy fear of the cricket ball too. I do. That's what stopped me from playing. Yeah, it comes at you so fast. Yeah, what they and it's it so hard. hard. It's very hard. But yeah, you had no issues facing it when they were throwing no. it hard. No, well, it Bowling was it. it was fifth form, fifth form girls, you know. Yeah, you're, Tri- you're eleven college. for the new listeners. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was a couple of years before they switched to the years. It's just it's such an impressive CV for someone commentating the game. What's your cricket history? Wow, average of sixty four. Yeah, 64, exactly. Sixty four, not out. Oh, was it out? No, no, not out. Not out. Not yeah, out. Like, I've got. I've, I've never been out in cricket. You're tempted to get back out there. No, I played a bit of indoor cricket, and I, oh, it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know what it is. I've just, actually, I played that, um, you know, down at the Cricket Museum. I was working on the um, cricket, the Women's Cricket World Cup, and I did that, you know, that virtual thing where you get in, and that was terrifying, mm. and it's not even a real ball. Yeah. And I, I put it on slow, you know, it was coming at me, I don't know, 60 k's an hour or something, and I just, it, it, yeah, I was like, no, it's just not the game for me. But then... That makes my admiration of the people that play it even higher, yeah. because I'm like, God, you guys go out there and face Mitchell Stark and you know, Jimmy Anderson and whoever, and you just, you know, and this is the other, God, I'm sorry, you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to stop me. No, it's the other thing on. I love about cricket, you know, everybody has to bat, so you're number eleven, you're not in there for your batting, but you still have to be out there and face those fast bowlers, and they will intimidate you and terrify you, yeah. and bounce it straight at the noggin. And you know, like that's it is a terrible that's, yeah. that's bravery. Mm. That's war, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. guys are looking at me like I'm. Fa- I'm. No, 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 I'm. No, no. I'm, I'm lost in this. I'm on the same cricket team knowledge that, um, like high school cricket, there'd always be if you knew there was fast bowler on the other team, it would be terrifying. Like a big unit that could really chuck it down. You'd be shitting yourself the whole game waiting to face that that big bad boy. And the thing is, now the fast bowlers are not only fast, but they're clever. You know, they, they, they pick your weakness and they mix it up and they, um, I mean, that's what's so fascinating. What They're not just, you know, um, coming down at your 150 k's an hour every time. They're just mixing it up and, you know, and someone like Tim Southey, you know, he might not be as fast as he once was, but he, I think, is um, bowling the best he's ever bowled because he's so clever, you know, using that crease and just every ball's different and like that sort of stuff is a joy to watch, how he puts an over together. Yeah. Uh, like, do you actually like cricket or are you, are you kind of, am I just going, are you like Tim who? <laughs> I, I'm exactly in your camp, so I never played it, but I love watching it. Yeah. I love everything about it. I read Viv Richards' autobiography at like Form 2, <laughs> year 8 for the, for the new listeners. Hey, just, how do you know the years? Oh, I don't know. i am just got a weird brain like that. <laughs> oh, I only know the years up to where my daughters are at. Right. And I forget the ones before and I <laughs> don't know the ones after. And I just I just know year 10 because that's where, what they're in at the moment. Yeah. Year 10. Anyway, sorry, yeah. carry on. No, you, you read Viv Richards' book. No, same as you, like a, like a cricket nerd, but n- like no skin and actually ever playing outside of the backyard. It's just fascinating. And, and I've read your, your spin-off articles, your, your op-eds that you wrote back in the day as well. Oh, right. Yeah, which yeah, are yeah, really yeah. great. And, and uh. talk to vivid memories of the 92 Cricket World Cup, which oh. was here, which is where I fell in love with the game yeah. as well. So it's really like a unicorn to find someone like you that loves the game so much. Yeah, but, I really... But, but doesn't have the skin in it. Yeah, and I don't Playing know skin. that, you know, commentators will say, oh, knuckleball. And I'm like, was it a knuckleball? How did you see... You know, all that sort of, the, those real... That, those things that only people that have played a lot of cricket can pick up. I don't have that knowledge, and I don't really need it, I guess. But um, I just love that real, the the mental side of the game is fascinating. And as I say, don't know why you'd play it. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, there's so much that can go wrong. Yeah. Um, but I interviewed Ish Sodi a few years ago, and I said, what a guy. Oh, love him, love him. Such a great guy. And I said, Ish, you know, really, probably. 80% of cricket is mental, eh? And he's like, nah, Sonia, nah. And I said, oh, okay. Oh, what was he? goes, 90. Yeah. 90%. And then, like, they've got the social media, the crap that they get. from. We're, we're not great, I don't think, as fans in New Zealand. We've got better, but we love to show, throw the shit when it doesn't go our way. And, you know, they've got all of that to deal with as well. Yeah, yeah totally. Totally. I want to um, start charting the path and I want to start back in the hut now I've talked to one of your your best friends and she said all true roads lead to the hut 
oh, you've got that so wrong. <laughs> oh, not so wrong, but it's just all roads lead to the hut. All roads lead to the hut. You know, like all roads lead to the heart, but all roads oh, lead to the hut. Right, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that's my saying. But I was hoping we could pick up um, high school. And mm. I understand uh, you and Tana Umanga were voted best bodies in the seventh form yearbook. <laughs> Have I got that right? Is that right? <laughs> oh, so I read that as best buddies, and then I reread it. I was like, no, no it's best, best bodies. Best bodies, yeah, yeah. Who, like, it's a simpler time so back then. There's so much to unpack here, mm. to be honest. Like, can you believe that they had a category for that? Yes, I can. Oh. If it was back then, yes, I can. <laughs> oh, I, my mum actually go, um, found the old yearbooks, and I looked up the and it's the most terrible, grainy black and white photo. Like, we're both brown. Obviously, Tana and I, and you just can't make out anything. <laughs> we're, just so, we're in the shadow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were. Um, yeah, we went to school together. Tana didn't play rugby at school. It was a leaguey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Might have played a little bit. We had a terrible rugby team. Terrible. What um, school was it? Parkway College. Wow, I don't even. Doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Got amalgamated. Yeah. Um, but great school. Great school. Not not academically, you know, up there, but just uh, yeah. You mentioned you were you were a long jump and sprinter. National, like, did you used to go to the regionals and then go to the nationals? Mm. Were you, was yeah, it yeah, that yeah. sort of prowess? Yeah, yeah. So I was in just before I quit at seventeen. I was in the junior world champs training squad. So then I had to make that decision: like, do I drop everything else and like focus on this, or do I not? And I did not. <laughs> I went, I'm 17, I'm going to university, boys, parties over this side, training, which hurts. And I didn't love it. I didn't love it. I was good at it. And, you know, I think it's a different era now. When, when I was a kid, if you were good at something, no one sort of said, do you like this? Because if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. They just went, oh, my God, you're amazing. Yeah, you're so fast. You beat all the boys. Go. Get yeah. Harder, harder, faster, faster. And, and it was just then that becomes your identity, like Sonia the runner. And I, I just... Yeah, I didn't, it wasn't, I love what, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fan, I love watching it, I love the Olympics, I love the, the world champs, I love, you know, all that stuff, but I still even get a bit nervous, those old feelings, I just get so nervous, to throw up before finals. Really? Yeah, yeah. Could peak Sonia take Tana in a 100 metre sprint? What was your, what was your, what was your specialty, 100, 200, 100, yeah, I did 11, 8 was my it, my PB, so I, I doubt it. I doubt it. You know, let, well, let's say yes. Yep. because We, we need the sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let me ask that again. <laughs> yeah. Could peak Sonia oh, yeah. beat Tana at high school? Absolutely. Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I hope Tana isn't listening. I hope he is. I hope he is. <laughs> and he comes, he and he comes he out of the come shadows. In. Yeah, yeah. Comes yeah. out of that grainy photo that in, in the yearbook there. But that friendship with Tana or the connection to him helped you out of a, a tricky situation oh, in the 2000s? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, when I left university, I started modelling. And I was very much a D-list model. Like, no, not D. Oh, I'm going to say B. I want to be kind to myself and say B. But I wasn't like in Milan and, you know, I was kind of South Africa, LA, all the kind of lesser known te modelling territories. Um, so I spent a lot of time in South Africa and I... Yeah, I, I went, I had a visa there, and I didn't look at the fine print, um, overstayed my welcome in my visa, uh, Got was threatened with an arrest, had to go to court, and was like, I, I know I can talk my way out of this, and it was quite <laughs> terrifying, this is a true story, a guy came past me with a ball and chain, Oh, this is Cape Town, uh, wow. like literally, like, I was like... I don't want. That. I don't want that. I don't not want anything to do with that. Yeah, not a hit. Not a stag do. <laughs> <laughs> no, actual massive steel ball. What the hell? So I'm sitting there with a, not a court person. It wasn't a judge, but you know, someone that was going to decide: Am I going to go? I don't think I would have gone to jail, but you know, I was going to be kicked out. Um, so I said, "Do you like rugby?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, of course I love rugby." Good. Oh, we're, we're into accent, we're into accent yeah, 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 my bro, yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of All Blacks actually went to school with Tano Manga, great friend, and he just went, whoa, <laughs> everything just changed completely. Oh my God, really? And then we chatted about rugby, because this is what's great about South Africa, probably the only country in the world that loves to talk rugby as much as we do. Yeah. So we just chatted back and forth, and he was like, you know what? 
I mean, this is a bad offence, but if you leave within the next two weeks, we'll just wipe it. That seems like quite an extension <laughs> on an already overstayed yeah. visa. Well, I explained to him I needed time to get my stuff together and say goodbye to friends and... Yeah, yeah, and the, but they were not going to, you know, if, if I hadn't had Tana, thank you Tana, I would not probably never have been allowed back in. And so I, did, you know, wow. went back five times. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Never overstayed my welcome. Yeah. Yo, I met this girl in the airport. She said she ran faster than Tana oh, Umang at high school. Yeah, he's brought the South African Yeah, out I did it with Madeline Sami, the South African <laughs> accent, and I'm just using every opportunity to flex that out now yes. as I can. It got some good feedback. What did Matt say about it? Because she's accent, she's the pr- that's she's her the queen. thing. Yeah, she queen. was good. She said she wanted to hear Stephen's accent again, the South African one. So if you could throw that. <laughs> I've only got one word, absolutely. Yes, yeah, that's good. all I do. Absolutely. Yeah. Mabru. If you say Mabru. Mabru. Sure. I'm not as good as I once was at my South African accent. How old were you at that stage, if that's not too oh, personal a question? Yeah, that's <laughs> so personal. How dare God, you? God, I'm going to say, God, it was a couple of years ago now, so early 20s. Yeah, right. Because I just think the, the to think on your feet in that situation on how to navigate your way out of that situation, was that something that came naturally? Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah. Actually, I've never thought about that, but yeah, I think I'm good in a crisis situation. Yeah. So when I go, whoa, yeah. brain, brain kicks into gear, yeah. I've just sworn on a live broadcast, how am I going to get my way out of this? <laughs> yeah, that I did. Joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nah, all good, brace for That was a good decision in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Can I just, get, circling back, as they say in the corporate world, mm-hmm. to that to that terrible um, F-bomb dropping, um, I did feel terrible too because... I hate criticising our players and I'd done it verbally in the biggest way on air. And poor Michael Bracewell, like everyone has these moments, these brain fade moments and has just happened to be, you know, could have cost us the test. (laughs) But, um, you know, I I thought, well, if I ever bang into him, I'll say, if you happen to listen back to that commentary, I'm really sorry. (laughs) But to flip it back, I reckon that would endear you to the audience of like genuine passion and a natural reaction of someone who cared about the result and what they were seeing in front of them. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that is true. But I do, don't, I, I don't know. I just think we're, we're so hard on our players and I don't want to be part of that necessarily. So, but if you're listening to this, Michael Bracewell, I just want to say it wasn't you personally, it was just me in that moment um yeah i would <laughs> in your feels <laughs> i would love know. someone to pass this on to michael bracewell and for him to accept the apology <laughs> yeah yeah and to go cuz i think he's probably been dark with me since I think that so. time i, I mean it. the great thing is they won that match in the most superb and splendiferous fashion thank you neil great wagner word. thank That's you neil wagner i made that word up <laughs> then. splendiferous splendiferous yeah yeah, yeah. 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 um in the cape town airport so, came up with that word yeah in cape town over there yeah and you're a model. Hmm. Um, link us up to the acting side of work. Because you sort of rose to fame in Shorten Street, but that wasn't your first job, was it? Before that, was it Sale oh, of the Century? Oh, yeah, my first TV gig was Sale of the Century when I was at university. So I was had Steve been modeling. Steve Parr still hosting that? Yes, Steve Parr, what lovely guy. Yes, yeah, sliding in. Sale of the Century. Yeah, 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 there it is. <laughs> Maybe that's your accent that you can land on is the Steve <laughs> Parr imp- <laughs> impersonation. <laughs> Is that a, it's not, not an accent. accent. No. It's not an accent. No. Um, yes. Yeah, so I was modelling and auditioned for this this role as one of the. Do you remember Sale of the Century? Yeah. They had the models and that um, weren't. You know, they said in, uh, to the gift shop with Jude we go, and there's a model selling, uh, oh God, luggage or sewing machines or something. We never spoke. We never spoke. So my audition for this job was to sell a one of those you know, swinging desk chair things. What do, what do you call those things? You know, the ones that, a desk chair that, desk that chair? turns. Yeah, you know? I think it's every desk yeah. chair, isn't it, these days? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I've never had a proper job, so I've never <laughs> had a desk chair. Um, anyway, so I had to, they said, right, we want you to sell this desk chair, in, you know, I'm in my bikini, um, without speaking. Now, most people, a lot of people would go, well, how would you do that? And I went, like, this is me, crisis situation, went, like, bring it on. So I just lay over that chair, smiled, waved, used all my body, everything to sell that chair. I did really well. Yeah. I, they said you did really well. Wow. Because it's quite a challenge, isn't it? And then they said, okay, now we want you just to smile as big as you can into the camera for 60 seconds without flinching. 60 seconds That's is quite a long, long time. time. Mm. But again, I went, nah, nah, I can do this. You've got this, son. You've got this. Um, and did it. 
yeah. because and the reason they do that is when the credits roll, you have to step out of the car, the Nissan Sentra, I think it was. <laughs> was it a Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Mirage? I should remember that. Um, you had to step out of the car and wave in your bikini and smile for the whole credits. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did it. Amazing. But God, that was the 90s. It wasn't, well, it was quite a long time ago. People listening to this are probably like I wasn't born. It's not that long in, in the grand scheme of things. And it's just crazy that, you know. Yeah, it's a weird throwback now when you hear it in 2023. Yeah, yeah. That you yeah. were made in, to audition in a bikini <laughs> yeah. and drape yourself over an innate object. Yes, yes, selling it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, that was such a great job because I'm at university and we got paid $500 a day, which was so much money at mm. that time. Still and I think I did now. <laughs> oh, <okay>. oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe I need better no, representation. Is, I'm sorry. Yes, it is a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Um, it was a lot of money when you're a student. So I'm living with my four best friends in a flat coming home and I've, I'm going, I'm shopping at like Workshop and Zambezi and, you know, I'm just living the dream. Then after a few months, the show got canned. Mm. Um, I hope it wasn't my fault. I, when you said you auditioned, I thought you might have taken over from Jude Kirk. No, no, Nay I Dobson. wasn't. No one wanted me to speak. <laughs> no, 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 there was no, it was very clear. You do not speak. So she'd sometimes come and Steve would talk. They'd talk to us, but we'd just smile. We didn't respond. We had no microphone. I'd just be like, eh. It was a very much a dolly job. I, 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 hopefully we can find some. Clips of that. He, he slides in. Eh? Was that his trademark? He'd yeah, come in yeah, sliding yeah. in across. Yeah, was no, in socks. <laughs> no, no, they, they put they put something on. I I could find out for you and report back on that. Um, what they put on that on that turf to make it slidey. It was something that yeah. I feel like he had quite a long microphone as well. Like the the bottom of the mic came down quite a way, but that might be a phase. A, a you had such a good. I I was right there, and I've got no memory of that. Yeah, it might I might be completely wrong. I might be completely wrong. We're we're getting into acting territory now, and I've got kind of half a story, and I'm not sure uh, where it's going to go, but we're going to try it out. Hmm. Mainsler acting course. Uh, you and James McConey. Meisner. M- Meisner. Meisner. Okay. Yeah, I knew. I, I knew. <laughs> I should have checked that. <laughs> I thought I'd just just throw it out there. See, if we got it. It's your when, you, when you're typing freak like frantically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Meisner, I, uh, Meisner. She'll know what I'm talking about. You and James McConey are supposed to do an end of year rap, um, and McConey's bailed on it. And then you had to find a replacement at short notice. Oh yeah, so you, you obviously you guys know James McConey, yes, um, yes. friend of the collective. Um, lo- I love James; he's so useless. Mm. And so somehow we we decided that we'd do. We, this is an eighty week course. It was long and hellish, but at the end we had to do this final end of year. Everything we'd learned in the eighty weeks culminated in one final kind of acting project. So James and I we're doing it together. Could not get hold of him. Could not find him. But you know, it's getting to the final days. I'm like, we've got, we've filmed nothing. He's not, is you know. So I brought in my dear friend Nick Jakes and my other dear friend Rowan Quinn to um, be part of my thing. And I called it "Where the Fuck Is James." <laughs> <laughs> that was what our thing was. And it was just everything we did came back to "Where the Fuck Is James?" Where you know, where's James? Yeah. So he really let me down. Then I hope he listens to this and remembers. And feels terrible about it. Can I just add a little exclamation point on this? Noting the name James McConey and knowing him personally, I reached out to him to get some Sonia Gray Shut information. Up, did you? And he didn't deliver. <laughs> <laughs> didn't respond. Where the fuck is James? Where are you, I James? I rest my case. <laughs> Amazing serendipity. Um, all right, so you do the acting course and you come out the other side and link us up to Shortland Street. Like, was that, did it go sort oh, of sailor the century? Yeah, no, nothing is, there's no timeline for me. I'm sorry. I know you're trying to put this into a, yeah, some yeah, yeah. sort of linear thing. No, I yes. jump all over the show. So, no, that was that was later when I was kind of like, so the acting course, I was like, maybe I do want to do acting again. Oh, give, yeah, give it a go because I'd never trained or anything. I'd just sort of gone in and gone, oh, you know, here's some lines. Say, say them. They say something back. You say something back. I should learn about this. Maybe I want to do more of it. Um, so no, previously, so I was on Shortland Street, I think, 99, 2000. So that was, that just kind of happened. <laughs> I just, yeah, another one of those things I just auditioned for and ended up doing, yeah. Um, is that, I can't remember what your question was. Does that answer it? Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of. Um, yeah, yeah, no, you won't. Tell, be able to. <laughs> to. You know, connect the dots. No, and there's no, you can't, you can't. I'll tell you now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, 
No, no you that, go. That, that, you go. That role um, of the villain character. I didn't mm-hmm. watch a lot of Shorten Street, but I've I've heard you talk about it since. Mm. Was this like she's a, such a hated character, mm. right? And mm. that sort of affected you off when you're walking down the street. People would mm. sort of treat you as if that was who you really were. Mm. Yeah, yeah, beer thrown on you, and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna beat you up, and like oh, but she was a horrible. She was, but no, um, she, she was misunderstood. <laughs> but yeah, how that came out was quite quite mean. I don't think she killed anyone though, from memory. Did you get killed off? No, nope, no. Nope, so I could still come back. I lost my uterus in a terrible car accident, so I could have not have babies. Right. Just in case you don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, my character's dream was to get married and have children, so she hooked up with Nick. Um, Nick from, I can't remember Nick's last name. Nick, Nick, thank you. Harrison. Nick, Nick Harrison. Who, yeah, Shorten Street. I'm closet or, Shorten Street guy. Don't worry about me. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay you can I, knew, I knew about your uterus and I knew that you didn't <laughs> get killed off. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted me to say uterus, yeah, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uterus. Um, yeah, so her dream was to just have kids and settle down because she'd had a very terrible upbringing. They didn't go into detail on that, but, you know, it was understood. And, yeah, so that was quite devastating for her. And, yeah, she was wheeled off to live in Australia with her mum and um, maybe she'll return. Who knows? Oh. Yeah. But it's that suspension of disbelief of fans of the show. That's a credit to your acting that people couldn't blur or couldn't delineate between fact and fiction, right? Maybe. I've got to say, it is so much fun playing a nasty character. It is so much fun because I'm – I like to think anyway I'm quite nice in real life. I don't like confrontation. I don't like losing my shit. It does not a comfortable place for me. But if I can do it in that environment, like it all comes out. So actually a, few, a couple of years ago I went jumped back into acting again <laughs> <laughs> off the timeline. Um, I did a Netflix movie. Yes, with, a, with an accent. He's a French accent. Well, it wasn't very good, but yeah. Um, and again played a nasty character and again felt that oh, this is so great. And I remember looking into the um, one of the other characters' eyes and just just totally pulling her apart and seeing her flint, like actually flinching wow. and just going, oh, yeah, I nailed it. Like, what, what, it's so mean, eh? What do you, where, what do you draw on mm, to go to yeah, those places? What you're the saying there, Seamus, is there must be some nasty in there, aren't you? <laughs> is that, yeah. what, you're is that yeah. what you're saying, Seamus? Yeah. It's not what I was saying. You paraphrased <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, is it, is it really um, unnatural for you? Or are you no, able to, when I, I th- action, uh, you're able to go we there? can all, oh, hmm. Yeah, I can pretty much go there straight no. away. Yeah, bang, bang. Yeah. And cut. And then you're like, I, I didn't mean that, by the way, just in case. Yeah, you I always do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so sorry, 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 sorry to everyone. Yeah. Re- it thank really you, thank is you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's weird that this is like 23 years later. And we had the same with Madeline Sami. She's like, I was on Shortland Street for like six months and people still come yes. and talk to yeah, me. Yeah, she was on before me. The fact that we're talking about, know. you know, this tiny little, was yeah. it two years, but this left such an, an impact on people. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, God, it probably wasn't even two years. But yeah, I guess that was peak Shortland Street when mm. everyone was watching um, pre-social media. In fact, I remember we got our first mobile phones when we were all on Shortland Street. I think I had the Alcatel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I remember the Alcatel. Oh, so ugly. Yeah. I, d- I wanted a Nokia, but yeah. I wasn't Snake. I wasn't paid that much. $500 a day. <laughs> <laughs> Less. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and then we, we started texting. I remember um, Carl, who played Nick Harrison, was like, hey, there's this thing you can do um, where you send this message. Like, you type it out, and it's only, I think it was 10 cents. And you can, like, meet. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Like, this is how long ago it was. We were all discovering this whole thing. Just, just indulge me for a second. Was mm. that the Alcatel with the pull-up aerial and the little the bit that folded down that you could speak into? Oh, God. I <laughs> stay don't. Out of the same <laughs> no, no, that's. I hate that's when it. I go down my tangents, but just let me <laughs> stay in one of those rabbit holes. I don't think that was the Alcatel. I think you're. Uh, was that Motorola? That was Motorola. Okay. That was Motorola. Yeah, my ex boyfriend <laughs> had the Motorola. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the early. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, early yeah, ones, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. the old flip top. Quite a, a brick situation. Yeah, yeah. No, the Alcatel was just your cheap 
ugly kind of, yeah. Right, right. I want to say modern. was modern for the time, but yeah. Wasn't it was, amazing how they could make the pictures out of all the little symbols as well? Like you used to get the Merry Christmas and it was a Santa Claus yeah. made out of like <laughs> dollar signs and dots and all sorts Still of weird shit. I don't know how they did that. I don't know how they do that either. Yeah. I don't know how they get music off cassette ribbon, but that's by the by. It's by the by. It's, it's and, I'm out, and, I'm out, and I'm out. He's going to pull us back. I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, oh, I, I, see, you, I see what you, who you are. You're I'm the, the path, pull I'm the path chatter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and I boy. go... I yeah, go everywhere. Yeah. It gets in the weeds. Do you get a bit pissed off sometimes that you can't be the one that just goes everywhere? I thought you were going to say, do you get a bit pissed off I with him? I get pissed off with him. <laughs> okay. All the time. Okay. Okay. No, but do you sometimes go, why can't I just be the one that like goes off on all the tangents? Yeah. Why do I have to be the grown-up yeah, in this relationship? Someone, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I do a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I, I want to just be oh, more. Fuck, I'm calling bullshit on that straight away. Man doesn't have enough kind of cultural references to, to dig into the vault. Oh, Ooh, shots okay. Fired. Okay. Yeah, so I think a just as a little experiment. I didn't, I didn't mean that, bro. I really didn't mean that. Cut. Yeah, it was nasty. Hmm. Um, as a little experiment, maybe you could change rock. Not now. I don't want to put pressure on you now. But I couldn't just, do that. Oh, you couldn't. Okay. <sighs> Serious stuff in me. But this is why you guys work. It's a collaboration. So you've yeah. you've realised where your strengths are. Where you I'm not saying you have weaknesses, but perhaps you do. Mm-hmm. And you support each other, and it's this beautiful symbiotic Stay, like staying on task. No, it's yeah, very it's, deceptive. Yeah. 140 episodes, and you're the first guest that's picked up on that. Also, we got told dynamic. that you often make diagnosis, and you are likely to make a diagnosis <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> and here we are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've already got one on you over here, Steve. Okay. Oh, can we get that later on? Once you work me out, no, say it now. What's yeah. no? I shouldn't. I mean, I'm I'm working in this space, so I shouldn't. But is there a slight dyslexic um, leaning? I love dyslexics. No, I've never. Melzner. No. I don't. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Melzner. What, what is, mm. is not Meisner. No, 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 no. That was just because I was writing down as your friend was was saying it to me, and I didn't have time to go back and recheck it. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. No. No. Whatever. You know. You can be into all of your. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's got dyslexia of parking, but that's a different uh, story. It's, <laughs> it's been a long day. It it's been, been a long day. It has been a long day. All right. Next I wanna, episode, I'll chart the path. I want to talk lotto, hmm. and when we were lucky enough to have you on the guest. I said to Shay, I've got so many questions about lotto. He's like, oh, I've got so many questions about lotto. I've hmm, got throw I've them got, at me. I've got a lot because you've been there fifteen years. God, I might be sixteen. I am the longest yes, ever. Yes, yes. Which I don't I've even remember a time pre Sonia with oh. Lotto. I don't remember who presented it before H- you. Hilary did. Timmons. Okay. She held the record. I mean, this is a record that's not official. I just googled it, looked it up, and went, "Hey!" Oh. In twenty twenty two, which seemed like an eternity away back in what two thousand fifteen. I could overtake Hillary Timmons as the longest serving lotto presenter. Yeah. Thinking I'd never get there. But putting, you know, pressure on the people that, you know, rolled my contract over to, you know, keep it going. So yeah, I nice. could have that hold that title. Um, yeah, so it's been a long time. I started with oops, I started with um a I don't even remember Big Wednesday again. Yes. Mm. The ultimate lifestyle. No. <laughs> I said yes, but sometimes I say you yes when I don't. Remember Big Wednesday? I remember Big Wednesday. Big Wednesday's still a thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, we we, we we kissed that goodbye uh, about well, what do I 10 play years on ago. You, <laughs> you, Keno. <okay. laughs> you, play, you play midweek lotto. Obviously, the marketing is not working. I have a chat to them. Yeah, I we thought now, it was Big Wednesday. Yeah, I thought Big oh, Wednesday no, was still it's, around. It's now so. lotto twice a week. Well, I know that. But yeah. I just thought Wednesdays was Wednesdays, Big Wednesday and Saturday no. was... No. Well, I, I, it can be, but there's not that. Remember the all the prizes? Movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, remember all the prizes that came with it? A big Wednesday had... The two cars, the boat, oh, the batch. Yeah. Yeah, Is that yeah. not a thing anymore? No, that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> oh. Again, I'll talk to marketing because yeah. obviously the I messaging is I just thought those were the things you could win if you won all the money on Big Wednesday. Like well, you could you buy, could, sorry, you could buy. Oh, no, those are there for you if you want them. Oh. But back in Big Wednesday days, you get oh, the shit. money, but you don't have to go, oh, where shall I spend it? Because you've got the Audi and the oh. Ferrari and the Batch and the overseas travel and all those the toys. Right. And then with the money, you can be sensible with it. Yeah, right. That was the idea behind it, yeah. So I genuinely thought it was still called Big, Big Wednesday. Yeah. Like, I'm going to get a ticket for Big Wednesday draw. Yeah. That's what I say <laughs> now to this day. You can say that, hey. You yeah. can say it. But how did you get the gig? 
in the in the first place. Do you like that's quite a big gig to get? I imagine it would be a tough audition process. Did you have to oh, sell yeah, the balls? Was, had to be in a bikini. Sell the, sell the balls. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was that was gosh, what was it? Two thousand five, two thousand six. So we'd matured mm. as a nation, and I did not have to get in a bikini. Um, no, I just yeah. I, that's funny. It must have been not that interesting because I can't. I don't remember. I went for a couple of, of auditions, but. Um, yeah, I just, just got the gig. We were down, we filmed at Avalon then, so I was living in Auckland and flew down on Wednesdays because it was Big, big Wednesday. Wednesday yeah. yeah, and then flew back on the Thursday. So yeah. yeah. Just the point, is that the best gig in the whole of New Zealand? Five minutes on screen. Three. Th- okay. Three minutes on screen and a day travel allowance, overnight in Wellington and fly back again. I did love it, yeah. That's great. Do you know when I especially loved it? When I had kids. Yeah. And that was, I just went to that hotel room and slept. Yeah. It's like starting a podcast. Yeah. (laughs) This is my escape this day (laughs) in Auckland. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but we moved to Auckland 10 years ago and now it's great. Oh, I thought it was still in Wellington. Oh my God. All right. (laughs) We can't, I haven't got enough time to educate you on all the ins and outs of Lotto. So after we've finished, we'll sit down and just go through everything that you do not understand. Is every draw live? Hell yes. Okay, just check in, just fact check in. Hell yes. That's why I say kia ora and welcome to your live Lotto draw. Yeah. They're all on the internet too. They're all on yes, YouTube. Yes, well that's not live, but that's, <laughs> that's the recorded, uh, that's the recording of live. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's a lot. these things work. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it is live because you know we it oh, has to be aut- authenticity is is the number one thing. Um, so you know, yeah, there's a million checks and balances, and yeah, it's, it's other live. than this punishing lotto chat. Do you get punishing lotto chat? Yep. every week. <laughs> Everyone wants to talk a lot. Of, oh, what are the winning numbers going? Like, what's what's the worst yeah, stuff? Who's the best shop I can buy a ticket from? Yeah, Where is the best shop I can I, buy a ticket from? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's random. Yeah. It's uh, not not the shops aren't random, but it, it doesn't really matter. Is that the boring answer to your question? A little bit. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Are the scrutineers real people? Yes, they are, and I love them. Uh, do they have a like a a desk? Well, I was thinking like a, a time frame. Like, do you retire from a scrutineer after well, four years because your integrity may be compromised? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, but we have a rotating pool from the audit audit New Zealand. But Suzanne who, I mean, I don't, shouldn't have favourites, but Suzanne is my favourite. Um, she was on the first ever lotto draw as a 20-year-old or something, and now she's like a big wig at Audit New Zealand. So she has been there forever. She's good. Wow. Like, she just, she's like, no, you, nothing, nothing gets past her because we have a lot of rules. Mm. Most of them I'm not involved in. Hey, can you play? Hell yes. I wasn't sure, you know, again, pulling the curtain okay. back. Okay, so if I couldn't play, mm. that would be like saying it's possible to rig it, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. It is impossible. Okay. You're looking at me like you don't believe me. Well, it's because Stephen always says you've always got to give yourself a little wiggle room, like never say anything's 100%, like always 99, so there's a little... I would say that about most out. things, but I've been doing this 16 years. I, like, if there is a way to rig that, I, I yeah, no, there's not. There's mm. not. Good. How this much, is good content. How much prep is involved in what you're going to do? Like, do you know it so well. Can you just turn up and go? Well, we we have three rehearsals and then we go live. Um, not rehearsing the ball. Mm. I mean, we, we, we have rehearsals. Good save. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have, we have a set of rehearsal balls and then we have our live balls. Um, a lot of balls, mm. a lot of balls lot talk, of balls and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we do those rehearsals just to check that the machines are all working properly and everything. And so, you know, very occasionally there'll be a little little hiccup. So after the second rehearsal of, you know, the scrutineer or one of the reps isn't happy, then we'll swap the ball out. You know, we have fifteen minutes between each rehearsal. Um, but yeah, then uh, I mean, am I? I don't know the numbers, if that's what you mean. Like, yeah, I've been doing it a long time. I still couldn't tell you what numbers are going to come out. No. So I'm not that good. Yeah. Hey. Are there any times where you do it and you're like, ah, 27, it's out again? Yeah, yeah, occasionally. I'm still, you asked if I can buy a ticket. And one of the things that I said, this is one of the things I remember actually when I was offered the job, is I said, I have num- lotto numbers that I play every week. And, you know, I I play them all the time. I can't miss it. So I have to be able to play or I can't take this job. 
Mm. Because as it's a good power as, move. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just like, you know, yes, it's um, well paid. That's wonderful. You know, this is a regular gig, but that's not like winning mm. multi million, you know, millions of dollars. So, what if my numbers came up <laughs> and I couldn't buy the ticket? And they said, no, nope, you're sweet. I you're imagine sweet. that. Yes, yeah, never like, happened. Seventeen. <laughs> 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 <Fuck it. laughs> Fucking see ya, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> How good would that be? Well, actually, I've always thought. Oh, what's the biggest win you've ever had? Can I ask you that? I'm, t- I'm so unlucky. Uh. I am so fifty-two dollars. Wow, that's mm-hmm. nothing. It's terrible. Yeah. And people come up to me and they go, "Can you kiss my ticket?" You know, I'm like, "You don't <laughs> want me to kiss your ticket." I am so unlucky. Mm. But there, and I always thought. On the day, if it happened that my numbers come up, I'd be really cool. You know, I'd just totally. And then um, one day, a couple of years ago, uh, the first ball came out. It's mine. 11. Second ball, 18. Third ball, 27. Wow. These are three of my numbers on one line. And I said to myself, this is fucking happening. <laughs> and I just felt this cold sweat come up. And I was, I just lost all kind of sort of like the F-bomb dropping in mm. the cricket. Just sort of, I mean, I, I did watch that back because I was like, I hope no one could tell that I'd just lost all perspective on where I was. Not calm in a crisis. No, 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 no <laughs> on live TV. Um, unfortunately, ball number four wasn't mine, nor was five or six. Mm. But I went to that place, yeah. you know, yeah, of that. this, it, life's going to change. And what it was would you a, do? What would you do if you won? Oh, jeez. What would you the do? The most painful <laughs> lot of chat. <laughs> Don't answer You're that. You're that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that the, the you asked me about um, people giving me, you know, talking to me about Lotto. Yeah. And people do love to talk yeah. about Lotto. But yeah, we do. Just ask stupid what, questions <laughs> like, what would you do if you won? No, the, the most annoying thing, and I've put up with it for a long time, and now I'm just over it, is can you call my numbers out? Yeah. Like, can you? Cross like, that like off, the, cross that off my like list. You're the, <laughs> like, they're the first person to yeah. ask me that. It's yeah. like, <clears throat> what do I say? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it will be a bit weird because the numbers that are your numbers won't be the numbers that are coming out, mm-hmm. but no, I'm I gonna, know. I'm going to pull us out a lotto before yeah. Shay yeah. asks. I'm out, I'm out. I only, had, I only, only had one more, which was any but, genuine mishaps that have happened on a live draw. Um, very, very rarely, but yeah, there have been a couple, but we have contingencies for that, so that's fine, yeah. Okay. I mean, the ball machines are amazing, but, you know, it, yep, some, there has been once or twice where it just – has been, you know, hasn't worked. And so we just go to abort, we abort, and then the draw is conducted off air oh, under audit scrutiny. I've seen that. I've seen that before. <laughs> yeah, I that, have seen that, that. That, prob- that did go I'm Vir- out. viral, that uh, one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. out. All right. Okay. Uh, we're going to okay. transition from Lotto to Young Hercules because you are oh. the second guest we've had on who's, who was on Young Hercules. Mm-hmm. Jason Hoyt, were you? Oh, that's right. I forgot <laughs> Jason Hoyt was on that. Well, I don't know if we ever did an episode together. Did any scenes together? No, what was he? He was someone. He had a great character. I can't remember. Oh, but Ryan yeah. Ryan Gosling was. You remember Ryan Gosling? Though. Oh, you, I remember Ryan Gosling. Yes, yeah. yes. He was young then. I think mm. he had his eighteenth birthday on the one of the episodes I did um, with him. Yeah, and so I played his sort of love interest, um, and I think we almost kissed. Mm. There was spark there. Mm-hmm. On script or off script? Well, I was sort of both. No, no, no. Well, on script. Yeah. No, I'm very professional. Yeah. And we, but we got to that point where we almost kissed and then there was a, you know, a ting ting. It was like, oh my God, we could be brother or sister. We realised, you know, I can't go into the full story, but the gods and, every, you know, Hercules, we could have, he could have been both of our dads. Yeah. And that would have been weird, yeah. sort of incest situation. So we just, you know, all that chemistry, we had to let it go. But later, you know, then he became really famous, and I was like, bugger, I missed that moment. In. I should have just jumped in there. Yeah, tag him in the socials and say, hey, remember this, bro? <laughs> was, this, was this pre-notebook Ryan Gosling? Oh, hell yeah, yeah. He was 18. Yeah. Oh, he was 18, yeah. yeah. He'd just okay. come out of Mickey Mouse Club, pretty much. Yeah. He's big time now. Ken. Yeah. Yes. Have you watched it? Have no. you seen it, Barbie? No. no, me neither. I, I have a funny thing with Barbie. I just, mm, I loved Barbies, but I think for all of us girls that were brown mm. back in the day, or and still now. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Shit, I've worked so hard on trying to get this. Okay, yeah, still officially brown. Um, we all were like, we just want to be Barbie, and we just felt 
really bad about the colour of our skin and our hair and all that stuff. And it's a bit just a bit triggering for me, just going, oh, yeah. you're making a movie about how, you know. And I know there's lots of wonderful messages in it, but it just brought me back to that time of just hating how I looked and the colour of my skin. And my mum is blonde, blue-eyed, and I was always like, you're so lucky. Yeah. I just want to be, you know, like you. That's what pretty is. We're gonna get we're gonna get there. And I'm gonna I can't wait to get there to oh. unpack some of that stuff. Oh, okay. okay. Just go, man. Just it, go. Oh, we're gonna go there now. Yeah. Well uh, Are you gonna go? You're going there? I you're can't believe you're going there. there. Okay. Well I watched DNA Detectives last night. Did you? Because you, you just stumbled upon it or because you were you were Researching. I was forward. research for the. Okay. I was oh, researching for gosh, the episode. Good. Yeah. Because um, I come from a mixed race background as well. So English father, Solomon Islands mother, and like I, I, I haven't watched Passengers, but I understand that was an interesting journey for you because for those that don't know, your father was Zimbabwean and came here when he was a teenager. Mm. Like backfilling some of that knowledge. How has that been for you? Uh, which bit? <laughs> Sorry, which bits? How's yeah, what? Yeah, that's a very open. That's yeah. a very open question. Usually, I, guess that, I can try. I can find something, but oh, you lost me. Yeah, that's okay. So you were raised by your mother predominantly. Yes, yes, yes. So then, as you moved into your adult years, and they pitched you this idea for a TV show to go to Zimbabwe or go to South Africa and kind of connect with your father's roots. How emotional was that journey? How was that journey for you? And has it become stronger since you've got a connection with Tao Maori through Kai Safari? Mm, interesting. Um, how was it? I yeah, complicated relationship with my dad, and yeah, wasn't really around. Um, he's passed away now, so he won't listen to this and be like, "Whoa, what is she talking smack about me?" Um, but yeah, like a lot of dads, just you know, that wasn't his thing. So he also didn't tell us a lot about his past, and we were always, you know, we had lots of questions. So the thing about DNA detectives is you don't know where you're going. So you pack and you go to the airport and you get on the plane and you're like, oh, okay, it's going to. So I always thought I must be going there. But then we were going to Melbourne. I was like, oh, this is a stink. But that was a different relative. <laughs> so then, yeah, we, we couldn't get into Zimbabwe because of the problems at the time. But we, we, I, I sort of walked across the, uh, the um, border from, from, from South Africa. But um, I think, yeah, what was quite emotional for me at that do on that journey was that my dad had told the researchers a lot of stuff that he'd never told us and I was just like wow that's great to know it but oh well how does would, would that have been to you know um yeah it was good but I think I, I can't it's been a long time since I did that show but I think I might have said and it might have been in there that I kind of went I'm actually feel really connected to New Zealand mm. after this and I remember saying to the director, she's like, how do you feel? You know, we're filming that, how do you feel? But, um, and I said, do you want me to be honest? And she said, absolutely. And I was like, I just, you know, it's nothing. Like, it's good to be here because I know that, like, I just, this is cool, but I love my country and I feel connected to the Indigenous people there. And, yeah. That's, wow. That's that. Has that, has that stayed the same as yeah, well since yeah, the yeah. Te Ao Māori kind of yeah, yeah. connection that you've yeah. been on through Kai Safari? Yeah, yeah. Because what's the premise of that show that's just all about eating it's okay. wonderful eating hunting fishing um uh, what else anyway it's food gathering basically with Pio Tede who's one of the funniest most wonderful people in the world so it was just a beautiful wonderful time for me and they those all, all male crew bar me and they those guys just wrap me up in a feed in love and just held my hand through it, and, um, yeah, I was just like, this is just such a beautiful world. And I was very, yeah, it really was the best job I've ever had, um, yeah. In terms of connecting to, like, the land and the sea? Just, and Yeah, yeah, connecting to the land and the sea, absolutely, but just really being in that world and going, this is what's important, you know, this is what, and, and just feeling sad because I think um, we, you know, we obviously, Māori have been, We've lost a lot of that. What's really important, and just to to really understand that, to really understand the root of it, and go, God, we should all be living like this, you know, where we just truly connect and are connected to the land. Like lo I loved all that. The you know, yeah, it was it was it was wonderful. I don't know if I answered your question because I can't remember what your question was. It's all right. We're just flowing. We're free flowing. Oh, free flowing. I love it. I love it. Oh, your mate over here is going. Oh my God, they're so off topic. Pull, gonna pull you guys. Pull, back. pull, pull in. Yeah, go on. Pull, pull us back. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to pull you back because mm. when researching this ep, I went on a bit of a journey myself, a bit of a trip. Um, and it started with watching your documentary, mm-hmm. um, Kids Wired Differently, mm-hmm. and then listening to your podcast, No Such Thing as Normal. Uh, I've read some articles. And I've got a six-year-old who I'm pretty sure is undiagnosed ADHD mm-hmm. and connected really strongly with a lot of the things you talked about. So uh, it, there's so much to cover mm, and mm. I, I'm not really sure the best place to start. No, but, but, me neither. <laughs> but I, I really want to get into it yeah. in depth. And, and perhaps it starts with 14 years ago you had twins and then over the last decade it's been an incredibly difficult and incredibly rewarding uh, and in, uh, just a, a, an absolute roller coaster of a ride. Mm. And I want you to tell our audience about, yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. So my little, yeah, so I've got twin girls and my little, <clears throat> my little Nezzy, Inez, um, about at the age of six, I think, just stopped kind of just being able to, I don't know, function even, just, just sort of went downhill really quickly, just... Um, was wearing the same dress every day, was just really angry and and upset all the time and so many things, Um, but was holding it together at school. So, you know, that's fine. And then all of a sudden didn't hold it together at school anymore. So there were a few years there where she was just running away all the time, you know, pulling classrooms apart, violent, just, you know, I had the quote-unquote worst kid in the school and I was just... It was such a shock to me because to, up to that point, I was like, and I don't know if I ever consciously was aware of this, but I just thought naughty kids are the product of bad parents in a nutshell. You know, like what's happening at home? What's happening at home? So jump in there, not a parent. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yes. That's my take yeah. on it. When I see that, I'm like, what's ca- what's happening here, guys? And yep. like, St- like Stephen suggested I watch the doco in preparation for, and I did, and even in the 24 hours since watching it, I'm like, man, I need to take a kind of step back as a judgy bystander and actually ask and be more inquisitive in it as well. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, <clears throat> and you know, we're at, we were very much at the pointy end of, like, things were so chaotic and so crisis level. But um, there's a whole lot of people, there's thousands of families that, are kind of in that at some level and are just going, I'm trying everything. I've tried the sticker charts. I've tried more discipline. I've tried the boundaries. I've tried everything and nothing's working. And everyone's going, it's me, you know? And it, it's very, it's it's so hard on so many levels. Um, and But, you know, now I kind of go, and yeah, it's been a journey, but now I go, what a gift because I'm, I hope now, a better, more understanding person and better parent because I now understand that my daughter's brain is wired in a completely different way and she's all those meltdowns and stuff is not her being malicious or trying to, uh, I don't know, get her way all the time. It's nothing to do with me. It's just that the world is really freaking overwhelming for her, really overwhelming. And she's, in a way, I'm kind of proud of her for going, nah, can't do it, can't do it, because there are so thousands of kids like her who have got it going on in the inside, but they hold it together. And then, you know, you see the problems later because that's not healthy. So she was just like, I can't, I can't. Um, yeah. A, a big part of the documentary and the story was talking about the worst of it and hitting rock mm, bottom. Yeah. And there was a an incident where she sort of ran away and there was a helicopter looking for her. Um, and, yeah, but it's, it's your story to tell, but the, the helplessness after that where – there, there was no. You, you thought, oh, okay, someone's going to come in and help mm, us, and there wasn't mm. anything there, which is the the power of what you're doing now and bringing awareness mm. to it. But yeah, yeah, that? that was such a pivotal moment because I was as terrible as it was. I, for anyone that has had a kid missing, it is hell, and you take yourself to terrible places. And I remember the um, <clears throat> hearing on the, one of the cops' radios, we got to search the waterways. And just going, oh, this is it. I'm in like some CSI episode. I don't know. It was just horrendous. But <clears throat> excuse me. But what happened was, I was like, okay. At least, sorry guys. <coughs> I'll start that again. <clears throat> um, what what happened was that I thought at least you know there was this little thing in my head going, at least now they'll believe us that we that this is 
this is real. This is a thing. Is it's kind of what I say to everyone. This is a thing. It's not me being a neurotic parent. It's not like the parent. It's just we're not coping. And surely running away means that we'll have this team that swoop in. You know, like, oh, okay, right. And so we've got the um, psycho- psychiatrist, psychologist, the this, the that, the support, the vi- whatever. And there was nothing except this guy that was just like, maybe you need to get a like a, a device implanted in her, like a GPS. Which I was like, what even, what? what? <laughs> like that, that was just kind of, kind of it. And then I was like, oh my God, they're sending us home. And we, we still have to like try and help our daughter. And I, I'm not... You know, like like one of the psychologists said to me, this is a PhD in parenting, Sonia. And I was like, hell yeah, because there's nothing. So, yeah, I that is, I guess, why I, from that kind of thing. Because the other thing is that I recognise that I'm in a position of privilege where I, for lots of reasons. And so, um, just... I don't. I know that I can compose the emails and you know do all those things. I will fight for my kid, and there are so many people not in that position for many, many reasons. So I have to be vocal for them. And yeah, that's the documentary I guess came out of that, and the podcast is yeah exploring things a little deeper. But it's such a complex topic, and no one story is the same. And I think there's just kind of messages that you need to get out there that you know this is tough. You were asking me about the the other side, weren't you? Sorry. I feel like I've gone no, completely no, no, off no, your question. No, but yeah, it, yeah. It's good. I, I want to talk about putting yourself, because you didn't want, like talking about the documentary, you didn't want to be the front of the documentary and let people into your life. No, but no. But you no. felt a responsibility to yeah. do it. And then once it went out and you could see why you had to sort of be the face of it, what was the response like? What was the, the feedback you got? It was so overwhelming after that documentary. It was quite like uh, that I felt overwhelmed in those few weeks and days and weeks afterwards because I got thousands of messages and from people that were sinking and I was like, right, I'm going to answer all these messages. And you just can't. You can't. Because you answer one, you know, oh, I'm so sorry and support. And then they, they, they come back with another question. And, you, you know, like it just – and I just was like, what else can I do? And I, yeah, I hadn't really been planning to do anything else. But, um, yeah, there were a number of people that came up to me with really, really heart-wrenching stories. And I was like, okay, I've got to do more in this space. Because it's just – you know, you know when you're in those situations and you're like – whoa, how did I not know about this? Mm. And now I'm in it. And people, no one else knows about it. And I've got to tell people this is a thing. And because the thing is, so many people don't feel like they can talk. So you think you're the only person on this island struggling with your child and trying, you know, with a really unhappy child or a child that's not coping in the world. And then when you put the feelers out, there's so many, but no, everyone's ashamed. There's so much shame. There is so much shame. And that... The sad and heartbreaking and tragic thing is that these kids are amazing. They're just not in an environment that supports that amazingness, and that's what's got to change. What are the stats on how many kids or people in New Zealand this this is affecting? Oh, right. Um, Yeah, we. (laughs) That's another thing. We haven't done stats in New Zealand. ADHD New Zealand are amazing, and they um, have done quite a lot of research recently but we're kind of going by what's happening overseas we could say that 20 percent of the population fit the criteria for a neurodivergent diagnosis so you're talking ADHD autism dyslexia dyspraxia one of those Um, I think it's probably more than that and then that doesn't factor in all those people that are close to a diagnosis but wouldn't meet it but still have real um, issues that impact their lives every day that they just think they're a bit crap, but they're actually, you know, brain just works differently. So, and we just don't know about this stuff. I mean, I, I got an ADHD diagnosis because my daughter's psychologist was like, hey, I screen all the parents. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not, no, that's not mm-hmm. me. No, good, I'm not, no. And he was like, just do the test, Sonia. I was like, okay, I'll do the test. And then he rang me, he was like, he scored 100%. Oh, no. And I was like, the competitive side of me went, yeah, <laughs> nailed it. The other side was like, oh, how does that work? And he told me about inattentive ADHD and, you know, how that my, my mental filing cabinet just doesn't work that well. 
And um, yeah, my mum was like, that just explains a lot about your childhood. Yeah, what has it changed since the diagnosis oh. about you? Like, has it actually changed the way you do things or structure Not your life? Not the way I do, the way I think about myself and the way I, yeah, the way I go, I, I don't expect myself to be able to do the things that maybe society expects of us necessarily, or I'll put things in place, I'll put frameworks in place, and now I can't even think of an example for you, but I'll, I mean, I, I'm terrible with emails. I have 40,000 unread emails. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I just, emails to me are just, I just, like this sort of stuff, this is easy. The email, no, you, you're amazing with the emailing, but like that, I find that quite hard, just going, what's the right thing to say here? Like, this is weighing on me. I've got to, you know, I, I need to do this, this, and this. And sometimes I over-deliver because I'm just not quite sure, or I just ignore it, which is bad. John Kerwin, we had John Kerwin on, said the exact same thing. Emails, just so overwhelming for him. You know, like a simple thing, which appears simple. Is, is yeah, yeah, and people, people will be listening to this going, just how, like just reply to it. Just send the right. Type it. Send it. That seems simple, but the ADHD brain. One of the big things that people don't know about ADHD is we cannot tolerate boredom, mundane tasks, or or using your brain in a way that's kind of has to think logically and you know we're spontaneous. We just kind of bang, 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 and so things like emailing, taxes. Uh, <laughs> Texas is a big one. Um, <laughs> uh, emptying the dishwasher, you know, stuff like that, that is actually physically painful. That, bo- that boredom, it, 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 boredom's not the right word, just we have a lack of dopamine. Now, do- the dopamine, which is your feel good, a feel good hormone, just doesn't deliver in the right way. And so we can't. It's just really hard. I can't explain it. Yeah. You, you, do you, yeah, then, well, you, you were saying that your son is potentially? Yeah, um, and this and only a really recent, before we started looking into you, maybe only two or three weeks ago, my okay. wife sort of said, like, one of my friends said their kid had ADHD. I went through the checklist, like, see if you think this is Bo, and it was literally every single thing. I was like, amazing. And we've been having some issues with his behaviour and regulating his emotions and all this sort of stuff. So... The question I wanted to ask is, mm. if you've got a kid who you suspect has ADHD, what's, what's the next step? What, what do you do? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> um, it's easier if you have money, which is terrible in this country, but it is, it is a long waiting list if you don't, even still long if, if you're private. But I would, so the ADHD New Zealand website is amazing. Um, yeah, go there first and go to your GP. That didn't work in my situation. Way back with Nizi when she was little, they just said, oh, the, my GP just said, oh, you've just got a hungry kid, just give us some juice after school. So, you know, don't don't feel that if you get that response, then, you know, you, you, you have to believe them. You know, you know your kid. You are the expert in your child. And if you know that something's not quite right, explore it. Like, you know, the struggle is that some people do, and I understand this, like labels are a bit scary. Hey, I don't know how you feel about that. Are you a little bit like... A mm. little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to put them in a box. No, no. Yeah. And there, that is the problem with this di- these sort of medical diagnoses is it, it does a little bit put you in a box. But the positives, I think, outweigh the negatives. And we're changing. This whole stigma surrounding you know, ADHD, autism, all the neurodiversities is changing pretty quickly because these are really exceptional brains. So... She says, <laughs> being yeah. ADHD, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, it's needed. It's just, yeah. What, what, what else, can I ask what else with your, with your son? Because he's six and it might, it might just be, a fa- it, you know, you don't know. Yeah, just, just all, uh, there's two types of ADHD, right? The- yes, although I think they're blended a bit more than we, we think. But yeah, yeah, there's the impulsive hyperactive. Yeah. So yeah, just can't control that, you know. That's it. That's impulsive, it, right. hyperactive. And yeah. his school said anything? School's fine. Keeps okay. it together at school. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Keeps yeah. Keeps it together at school yeah. and then comes home and it's just, it's all over the place. And it's, because I've got four kids, so I know what, you know, oh, the other yeah, ones yeah, are like. Yeah, You've yeah. got something to compare and yeah, contrast it with. Yeah. And you're like, okay, he gets into these sort of situations and you just can't pull him back and you've got to sort of manage him differently. And like, he's, he's really different to the others. Um, yeah, so there might be a bit of ADHD going on, which is a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. And it's just about learn, you know, for me, 
you know, very late diagnosed, but just learning about it. And does he have a lot of meltdowns? Yeah. Yeah. So at, just at home, not, in, yeah, not yeah, out yeah. with other people, not at school, just... No, nah, that's sweet. So can I recommend uh, episode eight of No Such Thing as Normal podcast, The Mechanics of Meltdowns, that will change how you look at his meltdowns because okay. that is, uh, it's a physiological response to a threat. Mm. That's perceived threat. Are we going too deep into this? No, not at all. No, okay. You can you can edit anything you nah, want out. No, no, because I, I if I can jump in here again, yeah. I'm sitting on the sidelines. But are you? No, absolutely not. I'm completely no, invested but are, in, are involved. You? <laughs> um, I'll diagnose you with something before we're out. <laughs> yes, and you'll be yeah, you'll be got? here <laughs> on the playing field. <laughs> well, you talked about like labels and things being intimidating, and I look at the list of letters after your daughter. SPD, ADHD, DCD, ASD, dyslexia, OCD, and ODD. Like that must be intimidating as a, as a parent to get this list of things before you have a better understanding of neurodiversity. And that is is that a, is that a, um, is that an accurate well, assumption? For, it, yes, for some people definitely, but for me, I'm like I want to get this sorted. So I she got one diagnosis. I was like, this is not the full picture, and I just. Keep, you know, there's more going on. And so that's, I guess, how she's ended up with lots of diagnoses. All of them, she's a little bit of all of them, but none of them describe who she is. Right. Um, and, you know, from doing this podcast series, I've kind of gone, God, I can see where the drawback with the diagnoses is because we have an idea of what we think, let's say, autism is. Rain Man. You know, yeah. the movie. You it's know, a, like, it's amazing like, that cultural reference point, everyone totally, goes totally. straight there. Or, or just, you know, it's always male and it's always. And then, you know, Nizi does have an autism diagnosis. It's, you know, there is some autism going on, but I kind of don't like to put it out there anymore because people have this idea of who she'll be and what she'll need before she turns up. And she's, you know, oh, she won't need like eye contact, she won't like loud noises, and she won't like this. It's like, no, no, no she's fine with all that stuff. And so that's where the box, putting into the box problem starts. So it's really tricky. It's really tricky. But um, I think the benefits do outweigh the negatives. But, you know, it's so interesting that there's still so much stigma around this stuff. Mm. And people still feel very ashamed to admit that they, you know. It's even, again, it's even like awkward to ask someone who's a parent about that topic. Like I would feel super awkward talking to you about it. Super well, awkward. Well, well, this is the first time I've said publicly. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that I think my kid has ADHD. You know, I'm not sure if that's all right. It, oh, oh, you, you mean well, your wife wouldn't like it, or well, just partner, that, or? I'm oh, not. This just this is no, such no, no, new that's territory. Okay. Yes, you know, okay. Like if I'm saying in public uh, to twenty thousand people, I think my six year old has ADHD. Like, twenty thousand people. That is a big audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, Good flex, bro. <laughs> I'm not sure. Like, I don't, I don't no, no, it's 20,000. It is yeah. 20,000. I'm very sure on that. Um, I think it's great. I think the more people that – because what we have to change is that this whole negative idea about it that, oh, mm. my God, like you saying that is saying there's something wrong with your kid. There is something wrong with the environment for your kid potentially, but there is absolutely nothing wrong with your kid. So that's the shift we've got to make. It's very difficult when you're talking about something which is uh, a te- now what ADHD what does it stand for? Attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Mm. And I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with it. And you're going, well, it's got disorder. Like, yeah. how can there be nothing wrong with it? So that is a problem. There's lots of you know hurdles that we have to you know cross. But um, th- now with so many people. Being more open, and I'm so grateful to all the people that have been on my podcast. I think it's really brave, you know, because there is still judgment. But every time someone says that, even you're just saying, I think my son might have ADHD, that opens the door for someone else. Because mm. people look up to you. You're cool. Ish. Ish. <laughs> <laughs> jokes. Yeah. Jokes. In that regard, was it a relief to start to talk about it? Because you're a public figure. You're on our screens every week. There's a social expectation maybe – that you pres- Sometimes you- twice a week because Lotto's on twice a week. Big Wednesday. Big Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, you've got a, you've got a public persona, but then from my research, behind the scenes was hell. Yeah, it really was, and I was it hard. Yes, 
mm, I think I just had to protect my daughter a, a little bit and go, this isn't all my story to tell. So that was really important. Um, but it had been so, so hard. I mean, it was so, and it felt so public anyway. Like she'd have massive meltdowns in the mall, for example. And that's just so, just on so many levels, it's so hard. And I was just like, I, I, I it was more like I have to do it. It wasn't about even, you know, how do I feel about it? This is bigger than me, you know. This is something has got to change. Something Somebody has to talk about this in a different way. Because the other thing was, I was, you know, I was like, okay, so there is this issue with Nizi, where do, you know, on Google, what do I do for help? And it was just like, there's nothing. And it's all really dusty. All the research, resources were at that time were just really like, whoa. And scary. <laughs> and like every, you know, you're like, oh my God, I'm going to have a lifetime of hell. And yeah, I just thought this can't be the story for people coming behind me. Go and watch the documentary on TVNZ, Kids Wired Differently. There's some great examples of what we talk. It's so hard to describe everything we're talking about. But mm. when you see, yeah. when you see Nessie, um, like fiddling with the pillows and the sort of five hour routine of what she had to do every night and the curtains and things. There's another one where you're taking her to school and she doesn't want to get out of the car because you're wearing the wrong pants and you have to go oh, home yeah, and change yeah, yeah. your pants. Yeah. Like that gives an insight into what you're dealing with. Cause you, oh, that was that was not actually the documentary. That was something else. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah another little little thing that, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, and that, and, and again, because I have to protect my daughter, we did not show that much. You know, I have to run everything by her, and she's very protected. Oh, you know, there's certain things she doesn't want. So that was just a tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, and she did actually end up in hospital this year um, because her the OCD got completely out of control, and you know, it was she just stopped eating, drinking, like doing anything. It was just straightening the pillows for three days straight. You know, this is this is the sort of stuff, and I know there'll be people listening going. Well, that, yeah, what were you doing? Mm. What were you doing while all this was taking place? And it's so complicated and so massive. So we were very lucky to get into Starship Child and Family Unit. That's a whole other story. That's an amazing, uh, full-on place. That beautiful experience because I stayed with her. But yeah, so that's that's you know it can get bad, and I know I'm not the only one. But then along the way. There's other people that it may not be at that level, but it's still hard. It's still like, what are we? Are we doing it this right? Are we do you know? And those resources aren't there. The support isn't there. You feel like you're on this island, going. Everyone else seems to be handling this whole parenting gig really well, and I'm not. Mm. There's definitely, I think, a lesson in operating with empathy. If you're sitting on the outside, like um, one of the confronting things from the doco was you talking about having physical bruising from. Um, you know, your situation. And then I think the quote was, it's like domestic abuse, but you can't escape. Mm. And that fucking killed me, man, when I when I heard you describe it like that. And I'd never, I'd never had that lens on it. Um, and I can't imagine the household having to kind of go through that, but then having to front like that, that this, the shame and the stigma attached to it that thankfully has passed for you now but yeah, having to yeah having to put a front on and then deal with those situations so publicly and being a public person as well, like just yeah, man, so much respect for you for for using your platform and standing up for the people that maybe don't have a voice and don't know where they can turn. Mm. It's such an amazing thing that you're doing out there, and I really hope by us putting a spotlight on that to a very maybe different audience than what you're used to can help people kind of navigate those conversations and and, and this area and territory. Like I've learned shitloads and. 24 hours about kind of oh, how to approach awesome. my friends who are parents. Yeah, yeah. And your friends who also might be slightly, you know, shiny like me. Yes. You know, you know yeah, like yeah. they just, I think, you know, a lot of us in relationships, they break down because, you know, the one doesn't understand the other's kind of, how the other's brain works. And I think just a little bit of knowledge, you know, learning about your own brain, this is for everyone, you know, not just those who are neurodivergent. Just is, is so helpful to go, okay, this is how I would have done it and what I would have said, but that's not what Steve is thinking. He's not, he's not even in the same ballpark. He's thinking about something completely different or whatever it is. You know, there's so many things. It's just, yeah, it's, it's, I, I've found it really liberating being able to go, okay, not everyone experiences the world like me. Mm. And that's what you, it's been thrown in my face though with a kid that mm. is just like not coping with the world. And Stephen asked me on the drive up, like, do do I have a 
a history in my family? Do I do I have any experience with it? A hundred percent, I'm sure I do, but it's never been diagnosed. It's probably sat particularly on the in the Pacific Island side of my family. I'm I'm sure it's it, it it's an explanation or a an insight into why people are like they are within our kind of family unit for sure. Yeah, yeah, and you know if you think if you look at the stats for people with ADHD, ASD, dyslexia, the negative stats. Like dyslexia is the big one. I'm just working on that episode at the moment. And um, th- they over 50% of our prison inmates are dyslexic. But over 50% of our the billionaires, entrepreneur, you know, the top entrepreneurs in the world are dyslexic. Mm. So that's kind of bizarre. And it's like there's this fork in the road. That's kind of, I, I just find it so fascinating because the dyslexic brain is fascinating. But if that, you know, all the amazing things about dyslexics, if that's not harnessed, if that's squashed out because they can't read and write that well, then, you know, you can go the other, take that other fork in the road. Which again, thinking back as a kid growing up, it's like, oh, so and so is dyslexic. It was like, oh, don't waste your time hanging out with him. He can't be your friend because he's dyslexic. Like there was such negative stigma. And you really did think they were stupid. Yeah, 100%. And it was the opposite. Yeah. They're actually amazing. But there's, it just happens that reading and writing are this, you know, we hold them in such high regard. Like you have to be able to do that before you can do anything. And um, all that creativity, all that like um, just amazingness. That Like NASA, over 60% of their <clears> – <throat> sorry, start again. Like with NASA, over sixty percent of their employees are dyslexic. They seek out dyslexics because they see that visual spatial ability. They can see things in three D. They can, you know, like they actually seek them out. Like, but you've got to, in order to get to that point, you've got to get through all the exams. All the sure, you know, you have reader writers now. That's that's great, but it's not really addressing the problem. Mm. By, by the time this comes out, um, the 10-part No Such Thing as Normal series will have been aired. So go back and listen to it. I'm certainly going to be uh, digging in. Um, but how was the experience of podcast? I mean, welcome to the podcast space. Thank uh, you. There's not <laughs> that, I was going to say there's not that many of us, but in a way there's thousands of us. Yeah, but. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot now. 20,000 a month. But um, <laughs> putting together 10 episodes of such a deep, topic with lots of voices coming in I don't think anyone that hasn't made a podcast actually really understands how much work has gone into mm, it has, I'm so assuming hard. it's been rewarding it's so but has it, has it been worth yeah. it? Yeah oh of course it's been worth it it's just been really 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 full on and yeah I, there's not enough seconds in the day to do all the things um, yeah so I, I decided to do a narrative style because I just thought neurodiversity is diverse and if I just have one guest then I'm in each episode, I'm not going to re- really do what I want to do. Um, and my the the producer and director of my doc of the documentary, Kids Wide Differently, was the executive producer of this, and and he was like, looked at the first script and he was like, no way, you can't you can't do this. This would take me nine months to be able to do these ten episodes if this is what you want to do. And I was you know so dogged, so yes, I can do it. And it, yeah, it's been great. It, you know, it's never as good as you want it to be never can tell the full story of anything but um yeah it's been amazing and i've learned a lot i'm now a pro tools i'm not gonna say whiz (laughs) i'm gonna say i can work my way around pro tools yeah more than more than Definitely more than me. I just come in. Oh, talk. you don't. You, oh, you just do the. Oh. <laughs> it's just, just the talent. I just, just yeah, he comes talent. in and goes down rabbit holes and. Yeah, yeah pretty face, <laughs> eh? Thank oh, you. You're welcome. Not like us behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, I'll be doing an all nighter tonight. I've got yeah, to you deliver said tomorrow. That. Yeah, is, yeah, is yeah. that literally an all nighter? You know, people no, say oh, I'm doing all nighter. I usually do about, get about two hours sleep. That's a long time. Thank you. To be, to be on, that's pretty much an all-nighter, I think. It is a pretty much an all-nighter, yeah. So yeah. is that knocking off at four and then up at six? Yeah, it varies. It varies. It, well, no, I try and knock off a bit earlier, but then I'll wake up and go, oh, I've got it. I've got how, you know, because it's getting that, that arc of the story because I want it. What I want to do, sorry, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'm not going way too far. No, no. What I'm trying to do is actually reach out to not just the neurodivergent community and people who think they might, you know, be in that territory, but to the whole of society, because I don't think we're going to see change until we get everyone on board. And so I'm trying to create something that speaks to the people that need it, but also is interesting enough for the people that are just like 
like yourself on the sidelines. And yeah, I'm trying probably to do a little bit too much. But um, yeah, it's always that, that tweaking and going, how can I tell that story? Yeah, so that's, that's what, yeah, so four o'clock in the morning, I'll usually wake up and go, oh, I got it, I got it. You're doing a great job. You, you're such a good person to be sharing the story. Like, I so am a good person. And so articulate and so upbeat and fun. <laughs> and like, despite all the shit you've been through, like, yeah. you're, you're, we're talking about like good energy people that come into a room and make you feel yeah. good and lift you. Oh, yeah. thank you guys. That's so sweet. You're still, Shay's still over there going, yeah, but she was so nasty on Shortland Street. Like, they're still <laughs> that nasty, <laughs> you, you know. It. Nah, yeah. I can separate fact and fiction. No <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm nearly done. Uh, one little bit moving away from that um, is your friend suggested that you used to have a party trick and it was if you didn't want to go to a party and be there for very long, you would arrive at the party, go large oh, and then leave. Yeah, sorry. I was looking at you really quizzically because I was like, this going? What, a party trick? God, mm. That doesn't sound like me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I recommend this to anyone. Um, sometimes we don't want to go to parties, but we feel like we should you know, because it's our mate or we just haven't been out for six months. So the thing to do, um, and the, everyone has different versions of this, but my thing is you go in, you are, you go big. You make sure everyone sees you, you're dancing, you're loud, you're funny. Mm. If you can be funny, don't yeah, try yeah. and be funny. If you're not funny, because it won't work. I'll just um, ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, it's good. So much truth in this episode. Finally, 138. We got there. I think you're funny, Steve. Oh, thanks. In a quiet way. No, yeah, she um, also said I was a pretty face, so just take it with a grain of salt, mate. Yeah, so you go, yeah, it's called go big and go hard and then go home. So you can do this in sometimes 15 minutes. And people think you've been there for five hours because everyone's seen you. When they're debriefing the next day, they're all like, oh, yeah, Sonia. Yeah, yeah, I saw her. She was on the table. Yeah, she was on the table. A (laughs) table is great. Yeah. Go to the table earlier rather than later. Um, Buy people drinks. Uh, You know, just just be, be really visible. And then you can get, then you slide out. Peacocking. Yeah. Peacocking yeah. at a party. Yeah. Oh, is it? yeah, yeah. You could call it that. Yeah, yeah. But it really works. Mm. Don't just sit in the corner wasting time. Yeah. Talking to someone boring. You know. <laughs> that is an experience play. What um, what is next for you? Like what are what? Mm. You're a broadcast broadcast. What are you? Do you have a label for yourself? No. Right. My kids asked me that the other day because they're doing careers night and they're like, "Well, what's your career?" And I was like. I hate the word career. I always have because it suggests that you should stick to something, which I, well, I've stuck to lotto. <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, not, I'm not very good at I get bored. Um, but what am I? I guess broadcaster, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that, not, I'm not sure. I don't, I, don't, I don't need a label. <laughs> that's kind of the great gig, though. You've got this anchor piece that ticks over and you're able to branch out and do all these other bits and pieces. Yeah. I'm you dip your toe back in with the Netflix production. Yeah. Any more acting on the horizon? Mm, I don't think so. If, if the right thing came up, I'd always look at it. But I don't, I don't, I don't love acting enough to be like, yeah, this is what I'm going for. So, what was it about the Netflix? That oh, it was just you? so cool. And like, how can you not be in a Netflix movie? Like, what does know. that look like? What are the nuts and bolts of that? Oh, that is amazing. They're just, it's, it's also one well, job. It was in COVID, so it was very heavily. Shoo. But um, I mean, it was a rom com, but it was just. That was just so lovely. It was just wonderful experience. I loved it. And does it open it. the door for people to say, "Oh, Sonia, would you be interested in doing some more bits and pieces?" Or was it? Oh yeah, someone. I don't know. I'm not really. Didn't really do it for that. I'm not very. Yeah, I don't have a five year plan. If that's what you're asking. No, I wasn't asking. I was just more <laughs> interested in what you what you pick oh, and choose to do. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I mean, look, it's not like people are knocking down my door with scripts, but I just it has to fit in with my lifestyle where, where I'm at. And it worked out really well because I was working on the cricket then as well for Spark. So that was in Dunedin. The movie was shot in Dunedin. And I was like, cool, I'll finish on the cricket and then I'll jump across to the next day. I'll go and start on the movie. So that, you know, with my schedule, that worked out well. Um, next up for me, I'm writing a book. Oh, oh wow. Yeah, I haven't started yet, though. And you're a bloody good writer. You are read, a bloody good read writer. read some oh. of your stuff, eh? Oh, you, you, thank you. Your writing is fantastic. Oh, it takes me a long time. I'm really slow, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. yeah but oh, book, book should be no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, what's 80,000 words? It's nothing. Um, and Can you say what the book's about? It is about neurodiversity and, yeah, it, about my life, I'm kind of funny. I don't know. We, we are, yeah. 
it will be my story, but I kind of want as little about me as possible, but the publisher wants it to be. Yeah, so we yeah. were in, you know, we're still deciding, but yeah, that, that will be after I finish the podcast doing that. And uh, we've got another series of passengers, which is going to be slightly different. My Family Mystery, it's called. And so, yeah, we'll be, we're looking for uh, people with a family mystery, something that they kind of, you know, a photo or an heirloom or something that they just want to know more about. So yeah. we'll be doing a call to action very soon for oh, that. awesome. Yeah. Storytelling or helping people tell their stories seems to be something that's constant through a lot of your work. Is yeah. that there's, oh. a, there's a power in that as well, right? Oh, my God. Yeah, I've only just realised it, like, in the last – I think when I did Passengers, I was like, man, I love people's stories. Like, I'm more invested in those those Passengers stories. If, you know, the Passengers, for anyone that didn't watch it, you should have watched it. But for anyone that didn't, it, I took a descendant whose ancestor had a really interesting um, – immigration story arrived on a boat and and something they knew nothing about so we were retracing the steps and I just got so into it I knew I had the family tree I just I just found it so fascinating and learning about you know how different cultures struggled like the Chinese here treated like shit like that was hard but yeah just hearing people's stories but giving people a platform to tell their stories is awesome which you guys do. That is essentially what we do. I was thinking, as you were saying that, I was like, we are so invested in telling people's stories. It's all we want to do, tell people's stories to the best of our ability. And the storytelling and creating a narrative and joining the dots and then getting to the deeper stuff is, you know, that's that's where the gold is. So. It is where the gold is. And it's great, like, what you do is wonderful because you're great facilitators. It's not an easy thing. Like, it's a skill to be able to help someone tell their story. But you're also, um, it's such a gift you're giving to that person. It, you know, to be able to, I mean, I've had the opportunity to tell my story a few times, but <laughs> but a lot of people don't, yeah. you know, and, um, and and you also, you know, I've listened to a few years, you, you get things out of them they haven't necessarily, the, the, the public don't necessarily know if they're well known, which is another skill. So And yeah. a few painful questions about Lotto. Yeah. You know what, I'm used to it, Steve. Mm. I just go, yeah, okay, this will be over soon. Five questions, four questions, yeah. three questions, because I'm a numbers person, obviously, because I work with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> a comedian as well I like another is, string to the bow this has been so cool thank you so much for thank coming in guys. and giving us your time it's uh, I wasn't really sure what to expect but I think there's some <laughs> real real goodness in here which I hope is going to help people like oh, Shay said who I haven't so. perhaps been in this space before yeah it's so, so hard because everyone's stories you know everyone's journey is different and you want to kind of go to little everyone and go yes you you know you're yeah anyway mm. yeah it's um I didn't do the shout out to my friend Beck, but that's all right. Do it now. Who's your friend Beck? Yeah, who's your friend? Beck. She's Beck. I don't. I don't know. If I can say your last name because she might be embarrassed. Does she follow us on socials? Yes, she loves you guys. So this is a shout out to Beck. I know you're listening, Beck, because you listen to these guys every episode, um, and uh, I know you're very excited about me being here. So I just thought I'd have you. And Beck could be anyone. Yeah. This is this Beck knows. She's single too, and okay. she's hot. She's a great catch. <laughs> All right. We'd well, be right. happy yeah. to promote her on uh, Between Two Beers socials if, yeah. if she wants to. Oh, that's nice cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. This has been amazing. Shay? Um, it has been amazing. And I want to thank not only you, Sonia, for what you're doing to bring neurodiversity to light. Um, for people like myself who have never really encountered it and it feels really confronting to... Um, normalize the conversation it's weird like I can you I can talk about racism I can talk about sexism I can talk about alcohol I can talk about all these topics which are all seem hot topics get into neurodiversity and it because maybe you can't see it it, it it's quite can it's it's an interesting one to navigate it is and it's just like we were at that place with um, uh, sexuality and and racism not that long ago really and we push through that, and I think we can do that with this stuff. And I think it's important that we do do it. Um, but I'm glad, thank you for being honest about because I think a lot of people feel like you. It's like, oh, this makes me uncomfortable. And sometimes I do like to see that uncomfortableness in people because I know I'm getting them. Yeah. And to Stephen's point, like the energy that you bring in as well, amazing. Great. You've lit up the room. But I also, for this episode, I want to tip the cap to my friend on the left for his bravery and. and sharing his situation and his journey as a parent and the difficulties um we have an amazing platform that we're able to share people's stories but 
we're also building our own story and sharing our own story as we go through kind of our lives. And I think it's a wonderful example, mate, for other parents, particularly other men, other dads that are out there that maybe don't feel comfortable to talk about that situation. So I'm going to give you a little tip of the cap in one of those moments that we've kind of bottled. You're going to doff the cap. As they say, as we've they got say, to bring to, everything back to cricket. To bring a cricket analogy back <laughs> yeah. into it. So this has been a really um, rewarding experience, and I hope a lot of people get a lot out of it. So thank you very much for coming oh, in and spending some time. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Cheers, Sonia. Cheers.